I know. I remember that because mom tries to say successful here, and that's a great three and a half minutes of this film. Probably the best <laughs> three and a half minutes of this <laughs> film. Successful. Seven fifths. Festival. My, my mother-in-law lived in a shack. I don't know what the fuck to tell you. <laughs> you all have to understand, in Sopoda, Oklahoma, no one has ever been successful. They've never had to use that word. <laughs> You know what? That's, That's the fair. first. This is the first time they've ever been called upon to apply <laughs> that word to a person. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because biannual six-hour history lectures were taken. I'm your host, No Illusions. Heath will be unable to join us this week, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? Shitty, Noah. I hate this movie, and I hate everyone involved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ugh. All right. We're also excited to welcome a special guest mascot to the show this week. Patrick Davis is a comedian, a magician, and we're hoping a real good sport when it comes to which movies we ask people to watch. Patrick, welcome to God Awful Movies, sir. Yeah, happy to be here. Not happy to have watched this movie. Oh, <laughs> wow. Boy, was this fucking bad. I mean, you know, we've done 234 of these. I'm used to bad. This was truly God awful. Every minute of this was just misery. So tell us, Patrick, what will we be breaking down today? Well, today we'll be watching Sing Over Me. It's the story of one man's struggle with half the men of Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> and Eli, how bad was this movie? Oh, well, if you love torturing children, but you're tired of not hearing Jenny McCarthy's side of the story, mm -hmm. you yeah. will love this movie. Yeah, in everything I could find on this on IMDb or whatever, like on Amazon and the movie's description and its own description, like it, they all have the sentence that this is a documentary about this man's, quote, lifelong struggle with homosexuality, end quote. I, too, have also struggled my entire life with homosexuality, but I feel like in a very different direction. Yeah, right. Now, like, yeah, exactly. That's the thing is that that could be interesting. You know, dude in Oklahoma growing up with evangelical parents and, 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 and dealing with his homosexuality like that could be interesting, except that this movie thinks that that's like dealing with alcoholism. Right. Well, also, also, like, I would like to watch a movie of a man struggling with homosexuals. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that would be a direction that I would be interested in taking this. Patrick, I am sending yeah. you a link on Pornhub right now. Yeah. Was, I'm excited <laughs> to watch it. Is it also an hour and 12 minutes? Yeah. I was going to say, like, we should at least all, we, we should all watch one of those after, right? Like, we should just watch an hour and 12 <laughs> minutes of it. homosexual men struggling with each other for a little while to wash this film off of us. Oh my I've god. I've got great news, Noah. I am <laughs> way ahead of you. <laughs> you got it for all of us. Awesome. I've got some titles I would be happy to recommend to your <laughs> listeners after the show. I am pissed negative minutes into this movie, right? Like I'm looking at like it's on Amazon Prime and I'm reading the description of it and I'm like, I haven't even started. I'm already pissed. I already have to walk out of the room for my pissed offness before I start the movie. <laughs> the average rating was like four and a half stars, oh. which seems impossible. Yeah, yeah, right. That guy can't possibly have that many relatives. Well, what was almost my best worst was best worst Amazon and IMDb reviews because the IMDb and Amazon reviews are either one star, this is horrific propaganda, please don't watch this, or five stars. So hear me out. I'm at a truck stop in Dayton, Ohio, and just whatever comes through the hole, I'm sucking it or fucking it. But then Jesus fixed me. Four and a half stars. Uh, wow. All right. So uh, that was one of your options. Obviously, it's not the one that you went with. Do you guys have anything you want to nominate this for being the best to be the worst at? Yeah. So for me, it was the best worst straight depiction of Oklahoma. Because I feel like they want it to seem like Oklahoma is like the heartland. It's where, you know, all the God fearing people are. Mm -hmm. But you also get this depiction of Oklahoma, just gay fuck fests everywhere you turn. Yep. <laughs> it's just one orgy after the other. <laughs> it truly is. In Oklahoma. <laughs> Yeah, no, we got no, we got de definitely got to see the seedy side of the state there. 
I was going to go with best worst shoehorning in your black friend. Ooh, in the yeah. middle yep. of mm-hmm. this movie, apropos of nothing. So this is a documentary about this uh, gay Christian gospel musician or hymn writer or or something. Well, I'm sorry, ex gay. He's not ex gay. He was completely made renew. Oh, oh. <laughs> like he's like he's a new person now. Everything about him is. That's different. right. That's right. Because gay him is dead and buried in his front yard. <laughs> I, guys, I really can't wait to get into this movie. Yeah, There's, okay. a lot. There's right. a lot going on. But apropos of nothing, right in the middle of all of this, he's doing this co- this talk at some conference or whatever, and he throws up a picture and he goes, look how many black friends I had in school, right? He right? Does. And then we move on from that. We never hear from any of these friends. There's never a reason for any of that. Well, imagine what happened in their lives, right? Where they got a call from their old high school basketball teammate. And he was like, hey, I'm making this documentary about how I used to be gay. Would you like to be in it? (laughs) Yeah. I'm not surprised a single one of them turned this thing down. (laughs) So I took the easy one. I was going to go with best, worst, sympathetic protagonist. Yeah. Because look, this movie resembles good documentaries about how difficult it is to be gay in the South. Like, no, no, no. It represents bad documentaries about that. But yes, it, but right, right. good documentary, bad documentaries that have good intentions. Yes. Right. It has the same plot points as yeah, for it, the Bible the tells me so. Right. Yeah, exactly. Or, you know, the God who wasn't there. You know, the movies that are about like how difficult it is to be gay or queer in the South and how problematic and horrible religion can be. But when you watch this movie and you realize that this is a sales pitch for conversion therapy. Yeah. It is a sales pitch for shocking your child until lying about how gay they are. Every bad thing that happens to this in the, him in the movie, my notes are like, good, good. I'm glad. I'm glad. I hope you get hit by a train next in your story. Oh. Cause this is. This is Hitler's sob museum. I truly like there is I would be hard pressed to find a worse human being to try and make look sympathetic in a movie. Well, so here's the thing, though, is that like he is both victim and victimizer in this film. Right. So I have a ton of sympathy for this guy because he's bought into this so deeply that like he's torturing himself and then you know, projecting that torture onto other people. But yeah, at a certain point, it's just like, yeah, like you've danced around this too long not to see it. Yeah. For me, for me, yeah, especially like, and we'll get into this in a minute, but like, especially for me, like there's like a point in his life where like, he seems like he's actually going to be okay and everything's going to be fine. And he just takes that off ramp back into terrible. Yeah. Like he he just takes that right hand turn. I was like, at one point I'm like, Oh, it sounds like your life is actually going towards a healthy place. And nope, nope. he just no. one eighty it. No, and, and what's amazing <laughs> is that in retrospect, after you get to the end of the movie, that moment where we were all like, oh, good for you, that was rock bottom. It really <laughs> was when you think about in it. In this movie's mind, yeah. That's that point of no return in the script writing book. Right, yes, exactly. Yeah. If you gave me the raw footage of this movie, I could recut a good documentary. I just got to take a middle chunk, put it at the end. I I've, uh, I've could do this. I can make it work. Yeah, right. Uh, All right. Well, normally I need to do deep breathing going into movies like this. This time I recommend that the listeners at home do so as well. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll dive into all the active hate crime that is Sing Over Me. Hi, I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Patrick Davis. And I'm No Illusions, here to talk to you about this week's sponsor, Being Gay. That's right, Noah. Being gay isn't just 100% fine. It's also good for the environment. Because we recycle? That's right. You do recycle. We know a lot of our listeners used to be religious, and some of them still are. So you've spent your whole life being told that being gay is immoral, unnatural, or otherwise bad. But we just wanted to take a moment right here at the start of our show to remind you that being gay is actually totally fine. It really is. So if you're gay or might be gay and the themes and messages of today's movie hit a little too close to home, just a quick reminder, fuck everyone who made this movie or is in it. Being gay is fine. Fuck them right in their faces. And now on with the show. All right, everybody, welcome to the first writer's room meeting for Sing Over Me. I'm not gay anymore. 
That that's right. That's right. None of us are gay anymore. Uh, so uh, what are we thinking? Well, I think it's really important that we tell Dennis's story. Yeah, that's so important. So so important. Right. Right. Okay. So uh, let's see. Dennis grew up in Oklahoma. And he did music. Uh, yep. And he used to be gay. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Crap. Is that the whole story? I, I mean, we, we could also describe all his gay experiences like, like a horror movie. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. That's, that's gotta be like a few minutes. Sure. Uh-huh. Sure. Right. He could, um, sit in the rain at a piano. Wow, that, that is going to be something. For sure. Uh, I'm not gay anymore. We know, dude. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Neither are any of us. It's great to not be gay. Yep. Super great. (laughs) And we're back for the breakdown, and we're going to start off wishing that Amazon had a watch now, but it's for work. I don't believe in this shit button right <laughs> but they don't yeah this this has ruined my algorithm <laughs> oh, my algorithm was already ruined i just don't want this hanging around my like historical profile or anything <laughs> yeah 234 episodes in i just want to say it's not the christian movie recommendations that get to me it's the edge case algorithm recommendations i get like they'll be like, ah, you might like wh- what would Jesus do, or loving Jesus, or Monster Truck Rallies Four. Put it in my butt. St-. It's just the weirdest <laughs> fucking things have happened uh, to my Netflix queue. It's so sure I want to watch Nailed It. It's so sure. <laughs> Nailed It's pretty good. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. Maybe I do want to watch. Yeah, Nailed exactly. It. So, like, trust in Netflix, man. Yeah. Okay. So we we start. This is this is a documentary brought to us from Freeverse Films. Yeah. So I don't know. Do you all do a lot of movies with Freeverse Films? This is the first. <laughs> so their intro card, just for the people at home, because I understand that a lot of you aren't going to be watching this movie. The title card. So you know, how, like Universal has like the spinning planet and. MGM has the lion. This one is like just a clump of pubes stuck <laughs> yep. right on the screen. Yep. It is shocking, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Yeah, actually. Um, now that you mention it. Okay. So we end up with a clump of pubes and then we get Zephaniah 317 sitting up there for the sea level readers. It's up there for a while, just in case you had to sound it out. <laughs> Hey, what part of the Bible is Zephaniah? Is that like in one of the like the Jew parts? Yeah, <laughs> that is in the Minor Prophets, I believe. Yeah, um, yeah. That was, right that was just a. I like not that I like am out thumbing through the Bible on a daily basis, but like I feel like I've got like a good kind of feel for the shape of it. Like you know, there's the Old Testament, the New Testament. There's like the Genesis, the Exodus, the all the Numbers. There's um, some stuff about Judges. Yeah, but uh, 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 Zephaniah was new to me. <laughs> yeah, look, because, okay, so at the end of the Old Testament, there's like a bunch of appendices that are the minor prophets. And I believe that's where Zephaniah, they're all like a page and a half long. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad he made the cut. Yeah. <laughs> just made the cut of this right, movie. Just yeah. real happy for him. Like his mom worked there. You know what I mean? Like right at the very end, they're like, and Zephaniah's essay is good enough. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, for me, imagine making it into the Bible. And still nobody knowing who you are. Yeah, right. <laughs> like you've made it into the Bible <laughs> and still you're nothing. So. Yeah. Oh, you know what? That's actually a really good way to introduce the uh, the fella Dennis Jernigan at the yeah, center of this movie. I was going to say, that's a really... I kept, I kept reading his name as Dennis Jergens, like the lotion you jack off with. <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep, yeah. So, okay, so this guy, uh, we start off with a a series of clips of, like, we're supposed to see, like, look, he's famous. He gets interviewed on the TV, but, like, you know, Patrick's getting interviewed on a podcast right now. Like, come on, you know, and it's all of this bullshit Christian TV stuff. He's, like, sitting there with these two Fox News reject ladies. So we got to talk about that for a second because they had the exact same haircut despite Mm -hmm. having hair lengths that are very different, which (laughs) seems impossible. (laughs) It's so like the show, like you don't, cause they never show like what the show is, but in the background you see like their logo and the show is, if you like pause the film and you like look really film, like it's a piece of art. You pause the movie. (laughs) You can see it says the show they're on is called at home with Chuck and Jenny. 
But these are two identical women interviewing yep. this guy. <laughs> I don't know what happened to Chuck. I don't know if we should be worried about Chuck. <laughs> What's I wonder funny if it's is, that Chuck. I think it might be the same Chuck, and I don't want to spoil it because we're going to get to that. <laughs> yeah, right. But I really think there's a chance it could be that Chuck. <laughs> yeah, no, I, oh, like, okay, all right. Chuck is by far the most interesting character in this movie. But we're coming we'll get back to, to Chuck, Chuck, guys. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. yeah we'll get there. And I just want to say it is legal to ride a bike in New York State wearing these women's hair. Just so everyone knows, you can <laughs> go helmet free if you've got their cut. They are somehow both the Kathy Lee Gifford of this show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so he's on this uh, interview with them and he's like, well, you know, I, I struggled my whole life with my own internalized bigotry. Oh, wait, I don't know that with with same sex attraction. He offers it out of nowhere. And we're like, yes! yeah, Dennis, we know. We know we get you. We look at you. We see you too. We have eyes. We, we know you struggled. <laughs> the conversation is this in order. What's it like to play in front of that many people? Really fun. You know, I used to be gay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just imagine them sitting on the couch next to him, being like, like these two identical women. Neither of them are with Chuck. I don't know which one's Jenny, but like <laughs> these two women clearly have, you know thought about each other and, <laughs> and then there's this guy who's like i used to be gay and they're like oh no he found us out yeah <laughs> <laughs> and this is where he announces that november 7th 1981 and i really really wanted that to be the last day he sucked a dick like he was gonna do a rock bottom warren <laughs> ellis story for us but yep yeah, but like he's I, I wrote in my notes at that point i'm like wow does he know the exact date of his first Gaying, I, <laughs> but even now I know I couldn't tell you what that date was to him. So okay, so we open on some singing, right? Like with the movie opens, we get the the title screen and everything, and we open on some singing. And it's one of these classic. You get this in Christianity so often. The quality of the song is way out of balance with the quality of the singers. The singers are actually very talented, and the song is utter shit. Yeah. And we also see him 30 years later, right? We have not seen Dennis Jernigan through this movie. We've just seen the clip of him when he was young and I guess more popular than he is now. And he looks um like a guy who's not been fucking who he wants to for 30 years. Like that's a yeah. great description of how he looks now. He's got those slumped shoulders and that, <laughs> that, that hair that's just I've given up. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of giving up written on his face. Yeah. And Noah, you mentioned this chorus. This chorus is a fascinating sample of humanity. The girl at the front, like, she's the most normal looking, but the rest of the chorus looks like someone hit the randomize on a video game character creator. He said, truly. <laughs> she's normal looking, but like, she's got like this hair that's like almost in the shape of a pie chart of like what percentage of the choir is not white. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's imagine an afro with a tiny wedge taking out like just like all the way down to her yeah, skull right. taken out of it and so it's like because there are two white people in this choir yeah and the rest of them it's it's the united colors of benetton <laughs> but this song is the, i wrote in my notes here that the song is basically the the fucking musical equivalent of your password being password it sure <laughs> is what were the words even to it? Do we even remember? <laughs> no, I wrote some of the lyrics down later in the to one of his songs just because they're all so boring and like, you know, he rhymes with me and all of them and shit. <laughs> so I wrote some of them down just to give you an example later, but I didn't have these ones. Yeah. All right. So then we open on like one of the most the, 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 the shots that we're going to get the most mileage out of here. This is him walking around his piano farm. <laughs> he it, he's sneaking up on his old piano in a field was my note i wanted him to murder it like old yeller yeah right right exactly. that was the piano yeah, the whole he played movie, it plays like he's gonna do that at some point like he's gonna put that damn piano down <laughs> Look. this is the this is the piano i played the gay music on and i've gotta let her go <laughs> Look, you guys you guys are making fun of his piano out in the field just because you're coastal liberal elites who don't understand that real Americans can't afford fancy music rooms and so <laughs> leave their pianos in the middle of a field. They have their own <laughs> field pianos, damn it. They're not house pianos, okay? We can't afford to have pianos running around the house. It's an outdoor piano. It's for outside. <laughs> That's why that piano is going to vote for Mom, Trump. This piano followed me home. Like, it's outside. The piano is moist. 
Yeah. Like, and he just, he does not wipe out the, wipe down the chair. He just sits right in the puddle. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's that, there's that, and everything. There's a tree in the distance that someone has been lynched from. Like, they're not still <laughs> hanging there, but you can tell that was its original purpose. Like, you still just is, see the bend in the, in the boughs there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like, he's just, and like, what's funny to me is like, so, so like, when we come to this field, there is an outright thunderstorm happening. Like, you're seeing lightning in the sky as he's walking through this open field towards his piano. And I feel like, being in an open field in a thunderstorm is already bad, but it's especially bad if you're gay and you think God's not like cool with that. <laughs> like, <that's, laughs> like that seems like a rest, like you're asking for it at that point. Like not that it's the victim's fault. Like I don't want to blame lightning strike victims here that it's their own fault, but like, <laughs> well, but wait, wait, but that's probably now that you mentioned that, I think I understand this scene is that like some of the people watching this. Okay. If you're Christian and you're watching this, you're not so sure. Maybe this guy really is one of the gays. That's how you know he's not, because he's like, look, I'm sitting right next to lightning and God isn't getting me. Obviously, you know, I am winning the fight. I'm playing a big wet piano and God's not touching me. (laughs) (laughs) So he checks into this little convention. I guess this is a, a big gig for a Christian artist like. We've played bigger rooms than this. Like, oh. I know, Eli, you've played much bigger rooms than this, but like, God awful movies has played bigger <laughs> yeah. rooms than We're this. We're literally playing a bigger room than this a week from today. It's, yeah, right. I've never, wa- I've never watched someone classified as a mega celebrity who I'm like, ooh, had to go for round tops because you couldn't quite fill a hundred in that buffet and fucking the Howard Johnson, <laughs> could you? <laughs> For me, I loved, like, because you get to see him, like, with his little roller bag, and he's, like, checking to the hotel, and everyone's greeting him, and every single person makes direct eye contact with the camera as if they didn't know that that was going to be there. Yeah. <laughs> and so he's just, like, you see, like, she's like, hi, I'm Donna, and then Donna, like, makes direct eye contact with the camera, which I'm told is a no-no, but, like, <laughs> he meets, like, she's like, hi, I, you know, some woman's like, uh, uh, hi, I'm happy to see you. I was at your concert in Waco several years ago. And I'm like, you look like you weren't in Waco several years ago. Attending concert wasn't the only thing you were doing. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So then they introduce him at this diabolical conference of de-gaying or whatever the fuck he's at. He opens up by saying that he used to think that God hated him because that's what it says in the book. And that's what the vast majority of people in his religion believe. End of sentence. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, we gotta we gotta cover the fact that this what we realize is that this little convention he's playing at is in a place called Midwest City, Oklahoma. Jesus, the name of that city is fucking oh. bleak. <laughs> <laughs> Midwest City. Oh wow! Is the so the saddest even, thing I've ever heard of. His fucking big gig wasn't even out of state. <laughs> no, imagine going. Imagine going from the heights of doing interviews at home with Chuck and Jenny <laughs> down to playing the Sheraton Inn yes, at Midwest right. City, it's Oklahoma. The Holiday Inn Express in Midwest uh, City. <laughs> and who gives a fuck? Ohio, truly, truly depressing. Oh wow! And he's also like warming up the crowd. With his ex gayness, right? He's like, how's everyone doing tonight? Who's drinking tonight? Who's fucking tonight? No dudes, am I right? Anyways, <laughs> here's a song you might not recognize. Bang, bang, yeah. bang. Well, but, but before he bing, bang, bang, he goes like, do you guys mind standing while I play this song? Uh, oh, that, that, when he, when he said, please stand, that had like real Jeb Bush energy to it. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's like, real, I wanna, please stand. I want to know what the standing ovation feels like, at least. This, I just... I just want you to not eat chicken for one song. Just the first one. <laughs> I just want to not watch you chew. That, that's the thing. Like, so first of all, like he sits down the piano and we get a big close up on the wedding ring on his finger, which is like spoiler alert. Like, I, <laughs> you're letting us know the ending before we get there. Let us enjoy the journey. Do that. Yeah. Right. But uh, yeah, it's just oh, this is a luncheon. <laughs> it is. <laughs> is this taking place at like 2 p.m.? It is. <laughs> it's sad. That's his big gig for it's his sad. documentary. <laughs> and then, okay, now we're going to meet Dennis Jernigan's parents. I would tell you what they look like, but you're already correctly picturing them, right? Like yep. evangelical parents of an ex gay white gospel singer from Oklahoma. You nailed it down to dad's <laughs> suspenders and belt. 
<laughs> the dad looks a little bit like if Truman Capote had never discovered riding, but did discover Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> <laughs> See, I have him as, uh, he looks like if the shield was about a security guard at the old country buffet. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so mom explains that, you know, her son grew up back when America was already great again. And then out of fucking nowhere of this, like we grew up in a rural town where nothing much ever really happened. He's molested in a public bathroom. Dennis is. Yeah, that one caught me by surprise. I'm not going to yeah. lie. Yep. So first of all, the mom's like, nothing bad ever happened around here. It's like, well, guess you were wrong, Mrs. Dragon. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Guess exactly. you were wrong. As that's echoing, he's like, yeah, and then this guy whacked me with his dick in a public restroom or some weird shit, you know? Well, hold on, because I would like, so what actually happened in the bathroom? Because like what it seems like happened is he like he was five years old. He went into a bathroom. A guy turned around with his dick out and was like, eh, and then he ran away. Was like, am I wrong in that? That's, that is that does appear to be the story. Yeah, like that's yeah. his that's his molestation. I just want to be clear like that. Like, I'm not missing a beat there. Yeah. yeah. And what he has concluded from that, by the way, he monologues. He was like. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that guy could smell the gay on me, and that's why he yes. tried to molest me. Yeah. Right, right. And I'm like, it's like, what are you talking about? You were five. <laughs> you were a child. Uh, yeah, who, who, to, but, but so like, I, I will say though, in my experience, Christians love to go for that gayness is the byproduct of being molested as a child angle. Yeah, very much. And like, and like, let's be clear here, like, what happened to him is not okay. That Whoever did that to him should have terrible things happen to him. Yeah. But it's not like that, oh, he could sense the gay on me, and that's what turned me. I was like, a, a creeper showed you his dick, and you ran away. Like, I think it had more to do with the fact you were a child than you were gay. Yeah. Yeah. And and we yeah. should point out, that's that's actually, it's really important to conversion therapy because the angle for most conversion therapy at this point is you're not gay, you were molested as a kid, and that yep. trauma created this psychosis in you. So, like, again, keep in mind that this is all the pitch for come shock your teenager into pretending, which is why he put this in the movie, right? Yep, exactly. So now we visit Chernobyl uh, so that we can see his childhood home. Like, see, he's like, this is where I grew up. It's this weird, like, did did they burn it down and then rebuild it for this shot? Yeah, it's, it looks like a very, very small Tasmanian devil came in right before they started <laughs> shooting. And, uh, well, here's the thing. I want to be clear. Like, it, it sounds almost like you could almost get away with saying, like, the house was messy. No, this house looked like it had been abandoned for years right. and it's not just that they moved out like because like the ceiling's falling in and the wall paint's all gone and mm -hmm. all this stuff and like it's covered in dirt and dust but it's not like they just moved away and let the house go like it's still full of stuff yeah well that's like, the thing yeah all their <laughs> stuff is still there like it's like they just like decided not to live there one day like they, they abandoned it like jonestown or something it really does it's like he's got boxes full of books that show like jesus about to do a 9-11 like it's <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> You guys, if you've seen the Jesus standing next to the skyscraper scene, I'm sure you pictured oh. it immediately when he. Oh, I was gonna say, I've him. never, yeah, I've never seen that picture before. Is that a common picture? That yeah, keeps yeah, actually, up? yeah, you see that quite a bit in uh, Christian literature. Yeah, but yeah, that's that's the best way I've ever seen it described. <laughs> but yeah, so and he's walking through his Chernobyl esque childhood home, and he's talking about how he was the product of toxic masculinity. He's like, you know. When I was a kid, I learned, I real quick realized there was something different about me. I like to draw and listen to music and emote. I, yeah, I possessed empathy, which if you think about it is pretty gay is the yep. point of this model. Yep. I just wrote in my notes at this point, like, I'm so bored by this guy's life. Suck a dick already. <laughs> but, no. uh, so his parents mention about like well he was ambitious and he tried really hard at everything and then we get this little snippet where he's like talking about how he needed to be the best at everything and he needed to be the best baseball player and he needed to be the best musician he needed the best at school because it was the only way he could get his parents affection and like that's real like that's like that's a thing that like when you're growing up gay in a place where that's not okay like this you have this drive that like 
I can make up for it by being the best at everything around me. And so that way people have to give me the respect and the stuff that I deserve because there's this huge fault in me that they'll find otherwise. If, if I don't, if I'm not constantly better than everyone else, they'll have a chance to like, look at me and see me and see this, like who I am. And I think that's like, you know, with all the election stuff, you know, there's this whole thing with like, is Mayor Pete gay enough? Of, you know, like that he's not the right. And I, you know, you you can totally really see that, that like he's a product of this of like growing up in Indiana and like needing to be the road scholar, the military person, the mm-hmm. guy who speaks all these languages. Like he is president of the United States, mayor of my town. Like there's this drive that we can have of needing to kind of build this shield around us of perfection so that nobody can like see this enormous crack and then like you know ultimately you come to terms with it and you're fine with it and now you're just a very successful person who has a healthy lifestyle but for some people it just bruh. i don't know if that was funny probably just depressing but like yeah no but that actually that that makes a ton of sense though that that makes a ton of sense so like like i like watching this movie like i know that this guy has become this like monster of a human being but like you really do see this like just the bleakness of what this guy's life must have been like growing yeah. up and, and, and how, uh, yeah, yeah no, there's a lot of sad just built into this fucking movie. Yeah. yeah. And again, like he's hitting all the beats of a documentary where he realizes it's okay to be gay and then has a happy life because it is, but he never does. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But instead he's like, he's sitting there just going like, you know, he's, he's, his parents were talking about figuring out that he played piano as though it was like, They'd learned that their son had leukemia, right? Yeah. Because they could tell that made him gay. Oh, damn it. He likes music. He's going to turn out gay. Which, I mean, that's how that works, but still. (laughs) (laughs) That's how they get you. Like, that's, that's what that is. Uh, it's just, and it's funny too, because like, like it's, it's all built in there. We're like, if my parents ever found out I was gay, they would disown me. And then in a real documentary, they would cut to the parents saying, like, we lo- when he told us we just loved him for who he was because he's our son. But here it's like the parents are like, yeah, no, we would have disowned him. Yep, yep yes. totally. Yep, would have yes. disowned him for sure. <laughs> 100%. Not okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, and then, of course, we we listen to some of his music, which everything he wrote sounds like a goddamn so- soap opera theme from one of them. PM soap operas in the eighties, and all oh. the lyrics were are like Jesus loved me even when I was sucking a dick, but I don't suck dicks no more. Right? It's banana. Also, we saw him do a sound check, and somehow the sound balance is off. Like during that sound check, he must have been like, "Hey, I just want to hear this ninety nine dollar Casio keyboard I brought with me to this Ramada. <laughs> Make sure they don't hear my voice." So he's also so like when he's talking about his childhood. He also has this thing where he's like, you know, I was just, I knew there was something different about me and I knew it wasn't supposed to be there. And then I would go out at night and like mess around with these boys, these older boys who, you know, would, they were get happy because I was happy and I, all this stuff. And I'm like sitting there, I was like, I grew up gay in Kentucky. And like, where are you finding these boys that were letting you fuck with me? <laughs> <laughs> Because like in my high school, like it was me and there was one other boy who was like very gay. And even we were like, like, we know this is okay for the two of us, but even still, like, is it? Like, I don't know. Where was he finding all of these gay teenagers in Boynton, Oklahoma? Like, yeah, you were missing out. Sepulpa was just crawling with just, gay sex back in the 80s. Yeah. I was just, yeah, I was just like, where are these? Yeah, I mean, the boys, like, they, we'd go and we'd experiment and they'd experiment with me and I'd experiment with them and everything was, you know, we were just touching each other all the time. And then I'd see them in church. I'm like, what little gay paradise were you living in? <laughs> I do you know how much I would have dreamed <laughs> of there being a cadre of like a gang of roving homosexual boys <laughs> when I was 15, right? <laughs> like that was the like, how did you find this? Oh, uh, just a <laughs> province town and Fire Island redone with the Muppet Babies cast. Oh my the god! Middle of nowhere in Oklahoma. He talks about and he talks about too. He's like he's like he's like and these boys like he's like these are like macho manly men. Like these were he men that you would that I would be doing these things with. And then you know I'd see them in church. And I'm like, if you think gay people can't be like macho or he men, that's a severe misreading of the back room of the Eagle on a Saturday night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, like that's ugh. oh, and so Eli, you were mentioning sound checks. Now it's time to spend a literal five fucking minutes of the movie on a Skype call with Mauricio. Oh, he, we watch him figure out Skype. 
I will look. There's a lot of unforgivable shit about this movie, but perhaps one of the worst parts about it is watching them just be like, "Can you hear me? C- can you? Yeah, can you hear we, me? We get yeah. the can you <laughs> hear me? Okay, shit on the VoIP call in the movie. Yep. Jesus Christ. Frankly, it was one of my favorite parts of the movie. <laughs> so okay, well here's the thing, Mauricio. He's talking to this guy, Mauricio, another recovered gay and Mauricio is a on a bad Skype connection B has a super thick accent C says um every third word and D is saying utter nonsense if you can make it out I had no fucking idea what was going on for these five minutes yep this is where the uh, subtitle went on for my version (laughs) well so so for me this is this is this call here and a lot of Dennis's music is like the signal of like where they're like, I'm not gay. And it's like, mm, you are because you, it keeps seeping out a little bit. Like <laughs> at one point, like Mauricio's like, my needy, hungry soul. And I'm like, your needy, hungry what? <laughs> <laughs> and Dennis is like, Dennis is like, I just want to climb inside Jesus and let yeah, his love just... wash over me. And I'm like, what? Like. Maurice can, has this stuff about how Jesus touched me deeply and poured his love all over me. <laughs> it's the it's the it's the Tobias Funke joke from Arrested Development where like he doesn't understand that he's just speaking gay innuendo, except they're doing it for real. Yeah. Like, right. No, so I was sincerely. writing in my notes like make the innuendo harder on me, dude. I'm a professional. <laughs> I can handle it. <laughs> oh. I'm just like you your body just wants to be gay so bad that you're just letting these little slips out every now and then. <laughs> oh. Yeah, but Mauricio, like, he talks about how gay he isn't for a while. And then he's like, hey, 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 do you want to see the woman that I have sex with? Check it out. Check it out, lady. Yeah. He drags this poor woman who does not speak English into the frame. And he's like, huh? This is the my anti-gay coach. I know you love that I still need an anti-gay coach. Yep. Listen, listen, looking at this wife's hair, like, I see why she married a gay man. <laughs> like I see, like like I see her hair, and I'm like, oh, I get it. I see what you were going for there. And frankly, she has to be pissed that the bet didn't pay off. Yeah, for real. <laughs> I get it. She's just always standing in front of the mirror. Whatever will I do with it this morning? I don't know. I'm not gay anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and like. I love, too, that we spend some time meeting Mauricio's son so that the movie can just stop dead, look us directly in the eye and said, if it wasn't for the anti-gay stuff we did, this kid would basically have been pre-aborted. You're right? murdering this kid if you think yeah, I'm gay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, you, if you support gayness, you support the murder of this baby. Which, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Like, I get that Mauricio and his wife have sex. Like, they have a child that's documented. Mm-hmm. He's not, like, going down on her, though, right? Like, well, Christian's it's, even allowed to do that? No, uh, not at okay. all. They're not allowed uh, to so, so then that, so anyway. that's a So he's like, that's an out for him. He doesn't have to. <laughs> right, right, exactly. They <laughs> just need to be fruitful and multiply. Okay, so I get it. I throw up because I know that it's against God's will. That's why I throw up when we, sh- we do that. <laughs> And then, okay, so we go back to, like, we get done with this stupid fucking phone call. And then Dennis starts talking to us about ha- ha- what a hard time of it he had in high school, right? He-, he prayed that God would make him be straight, which is really, like I said, a-, a lot of this is just terribly sad stuff. It's just that they they all, they wind up at the wrong conclusion in the end. Yep. Uh, we also get his miraculous Almost getting hurt worse story. Oh my, are they reaching or what? (laughs) One time I cut my hand and if it had been worse, I would never have played piano again. Yeah, man, if it had been in your eyeball, you would have been blinded. I don't know why. (laughs) Do you really have that little to contribute? And then also, this is an actual line from the movie. Someone help me out here. Um, He's talking about being gay in high school and, and trying to be Christian and shit. And he says, and I quote, I was constantly seeking the Lord's forgiveness. You know, like a ping pong ball, I would fail, try to do better, fail again. So I was constantly rededicating my life to the Lord. What the hell is he doing with these ping pong balls? (laughs) That's not how you play this game, dude. It's not. I mean, like that checked out for me. (laughs) Like I got it. I got it. (laughs) how you get into the back of the eagle you gotta yeah, land you go to that back <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't, 
Uh, Can we talk about his grandmother living in a shed? <laughs> yes, what yes, the fuck okay. Was that? Okay, <laughs> goddammit, I have a bedroom in the house for my father-in-law, and that motherfucker voted for Trump. What the hell is wrong with this family that they kept grandma out in the shed? It's, it's garden shed with windows. It's terrifyingly small. And, by the way, we cut from her shed back to the parents, and the dad's only comment about her is, Yeah, my mom sucked at music. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, okay, so he's walking through the field. He points to this tiny little shed, and he says, Grandma used to live out there, and we're just like, what, when she was bad? But no, <laughs> all the time. And then, uh, and apparently that's who taught him how to play piano. It's just this movie, like this whole section about his childhood and being in high school. Cause we get like, I'm not making it up. We get another round of stories of him fucking a bunch of dudes in high school, Yep. <laughs> but also everyone's making fun of him for being gay. But I guess, I don't know. It's the message of the story. Like bullying works because he's not gay anymore. Yes. Like, like that, like bully the gays. It'll, it'll, you know, it'll make them not be like, I don't understand. This is depressing, folks. This it's movie. so yeah. depressing. It's also mystifying because you have to remember that, like, he is hitting all these points about being bullied for being gay and being self hating for being gay. But his conclusion is the problem was that I was gay. Yes. Right. Yes. The problem with the bigotry is that I was not. I feel like, like, a movie's alternate, ti- the movie's alternate title for this could be It Gets Worse. Yeah. Yeah. Like just all the bullying. <laughs> it works. You're going to keep getting bullied unless you stop. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and of course, this is also we were we were interspersing this, of course, with him at that conference. And this is also where he out of the blue and for no goddamn reason says, hey, look, here's a picture of me with my basketball team four black kids and me. I was oh pretty progressive. <laughs> pretty progressive. But that was the whole thing. that's the point where we get like. I was told I was an inward lover. An yes. inward lover. Like an inward lover. <laughs> so the town's <laughs> racist as well. Everyone around you, all your friends and family. Well, but but look, given his logic, I guess the problem is that those kids were black. Yes, yeah, that was good. I really wanted, works. <laughs> really wanted it to cut over to like an interview with some guy, some African American guy in white face, being like, "Yeah, you know, Dennis really showed me the error of my ways." <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> <laughs> Reading the fuck out of the Book of uh, Mormon. He's like playing one of his songs at this point, and he's like, oh my God, it still sounds the same. And I'm like, yeah, Dennis, that that's how songs work. That's yeah, <laughs> that's what music if you don't, does. If you don't change them, it's just going to keep sounding the same, Dennis. <laughs> oh, the song is so fucking bad. He, and he's telling us the story of when he wrote this song, and he's like, yeah, I just had this inspiration, and while everybody's praying, I wrote it all in that same morning. And I'm like, yeah, no, it's... It, it sounds like that. that yep. You wrote it all in that one morning. So, yeah. While no one was looking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we, I guess we've reached the point in the story where he's going to be successful with his music or something. I know. I remember that because mom tries to say successful here. And that's a great three and a half minutes of this film. Probably the best <laughs> three and a half minutes of this Se- film. So successful. Something fits. Fits ball. My, <laughs> my mother-in-law lived in a shack. I don't know what to fucking <laughs> tell you. <laughs> You all have to understand, in Sopoda, Oklahoma, no one has ever been successful. They've never had to use that word. <laughs> you know what? That's, that's fair. The first, this is the first time they've ever been called upon to apply that word to a person. So you got to cut her some slack. Okay. Oh. No, that's fair. That's fair. She's like, I knew he was good at his music, but I never dreamed he'd be live music night at Applebee's good. Oh. So then we, we zoom yeah, in. She's basically his- like, he's pretty good for a faggot. Yeah, <laughs> oh, God. like that's like so, almost a direct quote. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So and and then we have to. So we have this little montage of like him being famous. I guess we zoom in on this old VHS tape of him playing for a sort of big audience because VHS tape is where you have to go for him playing for a sort of big audience. Oh, and all of this montage of fame is so fucking dark. It's like, oh, look, they literally pass over a plaque for him being a Dove Award nominee. <laughs> Not winner. <laughs> he didn't even nominee. Get it. Hey, do you know how oh. many people the Doves snub? <laughs> <laughs> if you get snubbed by the Doves, it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> 
This is this is a where are they now for somebody who is never here to begin with. The show is like, you know how like everybody will have their like their platinum albums on the wall or whatever. We see his scandium albums or whatever. It's like, no, you're allowed <laughs> to spray paint whatever album you want. They can't stop you. <laughs> yeah, it's illegal. It's not legally protected like being a doctor. It's also in this montage we also see photos of him and People no one will recognize. Yes, I'm sure it's, exactly. it's the least famous newsboy or whatever the fuck, but it just linger. This is Billy Joel's roadie. I saw him at an Arby's. Oh, shit. All right. Well, I guess now that we've seen the highs of his career, we can take a quick break, but we'll be back in a minute because this movie still has worse to get. And there we go. Hey, Eli, uh, what do you what are you doing? Ah, just making a butter sculpture. No, I I see that you're doing that. I, ju I just meant why. Oh, I just want to be as good at something as Peroni is at making beer. What's Peroni? Peroni is a refined beer with a distinctive, crisp, and refreshing taste and a balanced aroma. Wait, well, yeah, I knew Italians made wine, but they, they make beer too? They sure do. Peroni is brewed in Italy using a meticulous brewing process and only the highest quality ingredients. Plus, they blend the finest hops with two-row spring-planted barley and carefully import the result to the U.S. Ah, oh, that sounds fancy. It is, Noah, but it's also just amazing with a clean, refreshing taste. It's the ideal beer to enjoy when you want to relax or, you know, make a butter statue. Okay, but where, where can I find it? Well, you can look for Peroni at your next happy hour or, as the Italians call it, Apertivo. Find it in cans and bottles at your local grocery store and follow them on Instagram at Peroni USA. For people over the age of 21 only, 2020, imported by Bira Peroni International, Washington, D.C. Peroni Italia. Whatever you do, do it beautifully. Your statue's melting. I know, know it. I know. And so I was like, what? I can too fit a Pringles can into my mouth. I don't know why you would you, ask, but... Do you tell that story a lot? No, I don't. What? It's hey just... there. Inward lover. You've been out loving some inwards. I'm sorry, what? Oh, you know what I mean. I mean a racial slur. The bad one. That starts with an N? Right, no, but it just, it seems weird that you, in this moment, wouldn't use it. <laughs> I bet you would love that, wouldn't you? But you know what I mean by N-word lover. The real bad words you're not supposed to say. No, no, I do. But just since you're bullying, I thought maybe it would be. Well, you thought wrong. See, I've read Tanahashi Coates. I found his arguments about the white use of the N-word incredibly convincing. So there. Oh, okay. We're, uh, we're going to go. Yeah. You run away, you big J word, F word. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for more of this shit. And this is the point in the film where he shows off his sweet McMansion. Oh, he said, like, first of all, it's a large, it's, it's a, it's a fairly large home. Not, you know, it, certainly mansion is not the right word, but it's a large house. He starts talking about like, yeah, when I first bought this house, we gave a free concert. It was so cool. 4,000 people showed up and were on this hill. But then, like, he shows us a picture. Now, the, the, the rows are about 30 chairs across. There's about 18 rows. Not all of those chairs are full unless there were seven <laughs> other separate, separated seating areas like that one. No, there fucking wasn't, dude. There's like 235 people. Don't get me wrong. That's a lot of people to have in your front fucking yard. But it ain't 4,000. <laughs> the concert was called The Night of Praise Under a Thousand Stars. <laughs> and every picture he shows us looks like it took place around 4.30 p.m. <laughs> like, it's all bright daylight out. Everyone's in lawn chairs. They're all sitting <laughs> yes. out. It's the Night of Praise. First of all, a thousand stars seems kind of low. That's yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, you would think but you it's could the get Night more. of Praise <laughs> <laughs> under a thousand. Like, if he's accurate, there were... Four times as many people there as there were stars. <laughs> <laughs> so we need four people for every star every in the night star sky. The, <laughs> it was just like I'm like I'm like that's not a night you're showing us. That's mid afternoon. Yep, yep. <laughs> and that is also not four thousand people you're showing us. That's two hundred and thirty six. Yeah, and he starts talking about how like 
He's like, I prefer to do a home ministry. My house is like a big church because that way I don't have to pay taxes on it. This is all a fucking tax uh, shelter thing. And he's and he's fucking bragging about it as though that makes him a good person. Yeah, we, we also get shots of his home ministry here. And it is a, a karaoke home ministry complete with slide projector. It's yep. pretty dark. Yep. Well, uh, so here's the thing. And this is where we're going to like we're going to be serious for a moment. I think he might actually not be gay anymore because of the upholstery decisions he made. <laughs> <laughs> That's a solid point. That is like, a solid like point. I think there is a solid case to be made that like, hey, look, look, let's take a look at ourselves for a moment. We're very sure in our convictions, but we need to keep an open mind. <laughs> Maybe he's not gay anymore. His furniture is appalling. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Well, I love there's this sad, sad moment where he's like he's talking about how he has so many fans. He was so overwhelmed with how many people wanted to meet him. So he decided to meet them in his living room. And I'm like that, dude, that's the lowest level of people wanting to meet you. Right. Like I could meet them all in my living room is where you start. We're all <laughs> there. <laughs> yep. I was inspired by his decision to bring a bunch of repressed gay people into his home. And they can stay there as long as they want. If they want to sleep in his bed, that's okay, too. Yep, and they can all <laughs> sing together and not be gay together. It's a truly beautiful arrangement of just like, yeah, you're, you, you're, you're having trouble not sleeping with men. I am, too. Why don't you come over and stay at my house? Yeah, exactly. exactly. We, can, we can have trouble not sleeping with men together. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, and, yeah. And by the way, his home ministry, which is. Him sitting around with like nine other people doing karaoke off of his TV. He's got a microphone for that. He is mic'd for his own goddamn living room. <laughs> How fucking arrogant is that? Oh, it's fucking dark. This is also where he gives us his sales pitch, right? And this is his whole angle on the conversion therapy thing is we don't tell people they're evil. We tell them they're broken. Yep. Yeah. This is better. I just introduced them to Jesus because Jesus is a better savior than I'll ever be. But like, I'm a pretty good savior, too. So. <laughs> yeah, I had in my notes, I'm like a therapist who only prescribes Jesus. Yeah, exactly. It has no education. And now we meet another victim who's been condemned by Dennis's religion to never know love without guilt. His name is Eli. Yeah, Eli Bernard. And yes, this is my secret origin story. I'm finally glad we can get it out here on the podcast. He says, like, yeah, I was a big fan of him, and I'd heard his story about struggling with wanting to have sex with guys. So I, I got in touch with him, and I figured, you know, he's a big star. He would probably be busy and have nothing better to do. But, man, he called me right after that. Could not get him to... Get off the goddamn phone, be honest with you. It turns out having written some moderately popular songs in an unpopular genre decades ago isn't an activity that you continue to do. It's something that you did once. So, yeah, he, like, I mean, he's literally like, I cannot believe that this older repressed gay man would want to speak to me. A young man who is also struggling with being gay. Yeah. Like, who could imagine that he would want to talk to me and invite me over to his home and stay in his bedroom? Like, I was floored by such the idea. Well, and he goes, and he starts, like, giving us a little bit of his philosophy on how to de-gay people here. He's like, you know, it's not enough to tell gay people that they're going to hell. You have to do more than that. I'm like, how about less? Could you also do less than that? <laughs> yes. Jesus, oh. this is so fucking sad. Because we watch all these people, like, avoiding a fictional hell by living in a real one. Well, yep. I want to be I want to be clear here. I think I'm 100% sure Eli is pranking this guy, that he is 100% still <laughs> sucking dick. Like, <laughs> like, the entire time he's giving interviews, he's got a big smile on his face, and he's yeah. just, like, basically winking at the camera. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like you're still sucking dick. <laughs> like, that's... I also, yeah, this is a prank. It's also amazing because like this is obviously this is for Christian audiences and they have to be like super euphemistic every time they're talking about anything gay. You know, so they'll just say, and I was spending time with gentlemen or whatever every time. It's it, it, that, that can become a fun little drinking game all on its own. Like, every, you know, drink every time that they mean to say dick, but they can't say dick. Right. <laughs> You'd get pretty drunk. Oh, and by the way, if you need to make this story just a little bit sadder for you, this is also the part where he talks about when he was in college 
and he found out like they told him he wasn't good enough to major in music composition at Potawatomi Community College and Stump Removal Service or whatever it was. To be fair, he walked into that. He walked in there and he was like, hey, uh, I don't read music. I can't write music. I would like to major in music. And the dean (laughs) rightfully was like, we have a limited number of slots at our fake school. (laughs) We can't just let anybody major in music. Uh, Come back to us if you learn music. <laughs> it was Oklahoma Baptist University that he yep, went to. Oklahoma Baptist. He didn't rise to the standard of Oklahoma Baptist University's music composition <laughs> program. So, so I don't. I don't know anything about Oklahoma Baptist University. Is that a thing that you all know about? No, no, no. no. Okay. No. I just saw in your notes you all were like, "Oh, that's a fake school." I was like, "Oh, is this a?" Famous fake school. Like well, I mean, Oral anything Roberts that's Baptist University ain't a legitimate school. <laughs> but yeah, so. you don't put Baptist in front of the school word because you're crushing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fair. <laughs> Just didn't know if OBU had enough reputation. Yeah. <laughs> so then he starts talking to us about his experiences with contemporary Christian music. He's like, "Yeah, the people I really liked are people that you've heard of, even less than me." Honestly, Keith Green, does that ring up? No, Keith Green? No. Keith to Green? Fair, to be fair, I'd fuck Keith Green. So yeah. show a picture. would he? <laughs> they, they show a picture of Keith Green, and I'm like, he looks enough like that dude from Flight of the Concords that, like, <laughs> uh, He also talks about second chapter of Acts, which I have written down. Looks like Hanson's all-female stunt team. <laughs> Boom, that's a Hanson bird. <laughs> hey, you guys remember Hanson? Hey, how old is your listener base? Do they remember Hanson? Is that no. a thing they're going to have to Google? <laughs> that's a, a percentage great reference. <laughs> Topical. Thank you. Thank you. Someone will get it. One or two, long tail marketing. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically, he talks about how he's he's listening to second chapter of Acts and he hears their song that might as well be called I Don't Have to Deal with Anything I Did. And he was like, oh, shit, I want a piece of that. <laughs> right, right, exactly. I said I was sorry to myself in my head. So everyone that I've wronged forgives me now. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but he also like, but also like, again, super fucking dark right underneath the surface of this. He talks about the. The trauma of his artificially implanted self-hatred driving him to the brink of suicide as well. Yeah. Right here. Which, like, here's the thing. I, I, I had always heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, like, suicide was the one sin you could never be forgiven for because you die before you could ask forgiveness. I've heard the same. So, like, so like if you're like, oh, no, I'm gay, I'm so sinful— I should kill, like, I feel like it's like, like you're surrendering to hell if you just kill yourself. Like, I feel like that's the the only wrong decision. Yeah, right. Like, you could <laughs> ask God's forgiveness between thrusts, really. I mean, <laughs> right. that, at one point he did it. Like, earlier in the movie, he's talking about, like, like during that ping pong bullshit, he was like, I would fuck a dude and then I'd go to church on Sunday and pray on my knees and ask for forgiveness. Then I'd fuck a dude and go to my and I'd be the first one at the altar praying for forgiveness. And everybody in town was like, why is Dennis always there first? And I'm like, they know Dennis. They weren't yeah. really. <laughs> <asking>. but, <laughs> but like, but like, clearly he was already doing that. Right. Yeah. He already had that fucking loophole figured out. Like, so. like, like he'd so- he'd solve that brain twister. He like he found the Konami code to God. Yeah. So. And then, okay, so he takes us on a little tour of the music department of OBU. And I, I love, he's like, it was real hard to, to act like I was straight as a music major in this college. Anyway, here's where I did Glee Club. You see our little uniforms? <laughs> yeah, he, he joined a Glee Club and put on a blue tuxedo with a frilly shirt so that people wouldn't think he was gay. Yes, right, exactly. <laughs> but also... In case you hadn't noticed, this has literally devolved into this one time at band camp, the movie. It sure has. Right. It sure has. But guys, we get to meet Chuck now. This is where we meet <laughs> Chuck. This is where we meet Chuck. And I cannot begin to express what an enormous fan of Chuck I am. Chuck looks like Guy Fieri. Yeah, okay. Right. <laughs> Chuck okay. Chuck looks like he took Dennis to Flavortown. <laughs> yes. Like, there's no like, question they visited uh, Flavortown together at one point. Chuck's got the frosted tips. Yep. He's got the goatee. He's, ah, uh, Chuck. 
This is also where we meet Maureen. Spoiler alert, she's going to be more important than she is in this section of the movie. But Melinda, Melissa, what was her name? Melinda, right. Melinda? Melinda, Melinda. Melinda yeah. yeah. And he introduces her by saying, and, and I'm not j- joking, this is literally what he says about her. He's like, I remember thinking, man, if I could get a boner with a lady, I would totally marry her. Yeah, no, he said he's, he didn't want to marry Melinda. He wanted to want to marry Melinda. <laughs> he literally said, Wow, if only I could be aroused by her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was the exact goddamn wording, yes. Which is bizarre of a way to just think about a person. <laughs> if only I could be aroused by you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he starts talking about all the gay sex he was having in college, right? And Which, I, again, we're still in Oklahoma. Yeah, what is Oklahoma happening? <laughs> Baptist Community College or whatever. At, and he's like... Gay fuck fest every night. We had the orgies over at, <laughs> at the door. Like, it's insanity. Right. Like at, at, at some point, like, this is just a movie where he's bragging about how much dick he used to get, right? <laughs> I had grinder in college and was not having as much luck finding gay men as he was. Like, they were around every corner. It's insanity. Oh, Jesus. Okay. So we cut back to we're at his little conference or whatever. He's sermoning and he's talking about meeting a, a, a leader in the Christian community. He thought he was a really good guy and he would take him out for a Coke and now and again. And yeah, it sounds like a date. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> well, and then like, OK, so he says like and so finally I told him that I struggled with same sex attraction. And then he like came on to me, he made a sexual advance and the entire audience gasps. Right. But like, Why? I'm like, to be fair, you were on a date. Yeah. Like, and, you and, were dating this guy. And you just told him that you were gay. Right? Yeah. Like, like, okay, so here's how it goes. Hey, man, you want to go out for a Coke? Yes, I'd like to go out for a Coke. I, got, I should probably tell you I'm gay. Me too. Would you like to do gay stuff? Uh, no, thank you. Gas. <laughs> well, more importantly, like he talks about how disgusted he is and like you picturing him running through the rain, sobbing at the betrayal and yeah. that guy just sitting at the diner being like, Okay, what the fuck did I miss? <laughs> <laughs> and this is especially crazy because up until this point, he's admitted fucking like every dude in Oklahoma. Right. Like he is like he is like sucked and fucked his way through the Midwest. And then a guy makes a pass at him and he freaks the fuck out. Right. How did all this other sex come about? Like what about this was different? Yeah. Yeah, but at any rate, so that but no, he wasn't gonna be gay. For that gentleman. And then we he goes and he visits his old college apartment because they couldn't think of other places for him to go at this point. Yep. And he talks about and again, this I don't doubt this for a second about how he considered suicide because he figured his parents would be sadder if he was gay than if he was dead. Right. Flash cut to his parents being like, mm hmm. Oh, yeah, yep. for sure. That, Way no, better yep. about gay than yep. that checks out. That checks out. Yeah. <laughs> And and he gets so like he gets so tantalizingly close to correct. He says like, and I realized at a certain point I was just born this way, and this was how it was meant to be. But don't worry, Christians, it's Act Two. He's still going to think better of that, right? Yep. Yeah. This is where we t- he talks about the the boyfriend he had in college that like convinced him to actually say the words out loud. I'm gay. So this boyfriend sounds wonderful. Yeah. Like, he's yeah. talking about like. He's like dating this guy. Like, he's like, I'm happy with this guy. He's like, I think he literally says like, I was happy. Everything was going well. And I'm in bed with this guy. And he's like, say the words. You're gay. And I'm like, that's what a healthy relationship would ask you to do. Like, be acknowledged of your situation. And then he just is like, no, Satan. And like dives out the window. (laughs) Yes. This is the only nice person in his entire memories. Yep. This is the point in the movie. Where, like, because up until now, like, you can really, you know, you can really feel something that I can feel relatable to this guy of, of this, like, he's been brought up thinking this one thing. Like, he's, like, he's been taught over and over. He talks earlier in the movie about standing outside the church and overhearing the adult men talk about homosexuals and how terrible they are. And him recognizing that within himself. And that that just kind of tears him apart. That he, it's like the moment he realized, like, these men of God are essentially speaking God's wisdom or God's words about me to me now in this moment and it just sets him off on this like course of something is broken within me something's wrong and he's working and he's working and he and he's he's ex- 
finding these experimentations with guys and he's fucking all of these homosexuals roaming around Oklahoma. There's a lot of them. And there's a lot of them. It's honestly, it kind of seems to be a problem. I'm a little bit on the movie side. <laughs> like, so, and then, but then he comes to this point where like, he's, he's kind of a, like, a, like acknowledged that he's gay and he's, he's has this boyfriend and this boyfriend just wants him to. And, and at this point when he just rejects it all, and it's like, nope, I've got to turn my, you know, got to devote my life to doing the opposite of this thing that makes me happy. That's when, like, he loses his sympathy. That's when he, like, like crosses that Rubicon and becomes yeah. something darker and worse. And it's like, from this point on, it's like, ugh. Right, right, exactly. No, this could be a happy story if it ended here and him and that gentleman got married together or, like, w went off and lived uh, happily ever after or whatever. But no, this movie's just getting ramped up. He could not shed his self-loathing, so he broke up with that guy, right? And, and he's telling this story in his little fucking conference or whatever, and he's like, they call it love, but it was nothing but being used. It was selfish. And I'm like, first of all, no. Secondly, no. And third, those are two opposite things, being used and selfish stuff. Yeah, he never explains how he was being used. Like he's like looking at this audience, he goes, I thought I was in love, but I was just being used. And I'm like, how are you being used? It sounded like you were in a good relationship. It sounded like he was looking out for you. You yeah. know, it'd be one thing if the relationship was just like you wanted more and he was just using you for sex because he had his own problems. But he sounded like it sounded like you were using him for sex. It sounds like you were the one using right. someone. Right. Yeah. Uh, this guy's a piece of shit. But yeah, but then he's like, he's sure he's is. complaining about how he cared more about his own happiness than that of a mythical undead carpenter. So he decided to go into the ministry. Yep. So then this is when we get the phone call from Chuck. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so you, now you don't know about this one, Patrick. I have to explain this because he, he gets a phone call from Chuck and Chuck's like, I have to tell you about my dream. Now we have had a, had a long standing thing on this show that, the only person required to listen to your dreams is the person fucking you. So if somebody tells yeah. you about your dream, they have to fuck you. The fact exactly. that Chuck called Dennis to tell him about his dream tells us everything we need to know about these <laughs> these guys' relationship here. Oh, like I was seriously shipping Chuck and Dennis throughout this movie. <laughs> like I just want the best for them. I want them to be happy together. I want them to move to Vermont and open a bread and breakfast. <laughs> like, <laughs> like they're like what they have is special. I, well, okay, so so Chuck dreamed that Dennis was going to be moderately famous-ish. Yeah, like it wasn't even like you're going to be a star. It's no. like I had visions of you performing at the Ramada Inn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at 2 p.m. <laughs> what if I told you that you would accompany unlimited soup, salad, and breadsticks? Hear me out. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But hey, but hey, it was miraculous. Chuck's mom also had that dream that Dennis got moderately famous-ish. This is where this is where the fan fiction took a turn. Because <laughs> Chuck living with his mom wakes up, tells his mom this dream. And the mom's like, yeah, I also had that dream, son. Why, do they talk about their dreams every morning at breakfast? Like, what the <laughs> fuck is happening? Well, also, you got to keep in mind here that the, the narrative that Dennis is setting up for us is that he was torn between homosexuality and living in his friend's basement Making gospel music. Well, right, right. So, yeah, the, the end of this is that he moves in with Chuck, whose home address he gives us, by the way, which is he really sure fucking does. Weird. Very strange. <laughs> Sending yeah, Chuck a letter. Yeah, he just announces it. He like, and I think he literally says, he says, like, I was getting calls from two different directions, from homosexuality on one end and from Chuck on the other. And I'm like, I think the call's coming from inside the house. <laughs> like, I think it's the same fucking call there, Dennis. I don't think those are two different lines. I, I was think it's just the pulled, same one. I was being pulled this way and pulled that way. Chuck pulled me really hard. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> and also, by the way, so like what you, what you just, you, you get the impression that this all comes from a conversation that Chuck and Dennis had before the documentary where Dennis was like, no, no, I promise everybody, it, I will set you up as the opposite of gayness, right? I'll even say, like, on one hand, I had gayness. On the other hand, I had Chuck, right? No one I, will ever know. My friend know. Chuck with the frosted tip. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Who lives with his mom. <laughs> oh, Jesus. And, okay, so, he, and, and just to give you an idea of the level of self-loathing in this guy, it, at this point, Dennis starts telling us about how he was in the same league of sin as David, the biblical David. Right, the guy who raped a lady that he was spying on in the bath and then had her husband killed so she wouldn't tell on him. Yep. Right? Yep. You licked Chuck's balls. 
Right. That's not like to, to quote Samuel L. Jackson. That's not even the same fucking sport. Yep. It is a very weird comparison to make. Also, like his point is like, I mean, everyone remembered Dave for the not murdery parts, right? No, we don't. We remember him for the murdery parts. You thought of the murdery parts right away. <laughs> Wait, did you just call him Dave? Yeah, I mean, like, are you are you on a first name basis with King David of, of the Bible? <laughs> yeah, you, when you've read it as many times as we have, we're tight like that. <laughs> so you have to you have to understand that uh, this movie opens with a quote from Zephy. Yeah, so, <laughs> the Zephyr, as I call him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, all right, and so then then one night, Chuck, who loves the pussy, by the way, confronted Dennis about his gayness. Yeah, he was like, Chuck confronted me, and I'm like, go on. I'm like starting to like get the lotion out. Yeah, and right. Un- <laughs> I put dim un- the lights. The belt. I'm like, go on. He, conf- he like cornered you, and what happened next? <laughs> <laughs> so then, so Chuck found out he was gay, and, and this is he, how he tells the story. He ran out of the room, and then Chuck said, you know, I want to help you. I don't know how to help you, but I know the answer. I'm like, you were running out of the fucking room. Are, was he running behind you screaming it logistically this makes no fucking sense Noah it's because you're not gay you have to picture this <laughs> you have to picture this as like the notebook like this is <laughs> it's raining outside Chuck comes up to Dennis and he's like Dennis I know and Dennis is like no and he runs out and it's pouring down rain and Chuck runs after him and he turns around in the rain and they're face to face and he's like Dennis <laughs> I don't know how to help you I only know how to love you. <laughs> and then they kiss passionately. <laughs> yep. Like, that, like that's what happened. <laughs> like, that's the story. Oh, so much better movie. Such a better movie. Well, right, because then at this point, it's like, and Chuck told me, he says, you know, he wanted to be right there for me. Anytime I ever felt tempted to sin again, he would be right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, give me a, just call me up. Anytime you feel like touching a dude, call me immediately. Like, I'm your guy. If you ever call think that you're in danger of sucking a penis, I want to be there in the room with you. He's like, I want to be closer to you than a brother. He says like, that literally. So like a boyfriend? Yeah, that's a line. He's like, walk with me towards Jesus. You know, walk with me, your boyfriend, towards yes. Jesus. <laughs> yes! I just want to let Dennis and Chuck fuck. Like, that's all they want to do. Just Amen, let them do brother. It. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what. We're going to pause for a minute to start the Let Dennis and Chuck Fuck petition at moveon.org. So we're going to need a quick break. But first, let me give it Act 3 the hard sell here. Will Dennis and Chuck cut the sexual tension and fuck already? Who the hell do they think they're fooling? Is it them they think they're fooling or us? Find out the answers to different questions in less. When we return for the putting the sad and sadistic conclusion of... Sing over me. So, yeah, man, if you like ever need anything, just let me know. Thank you so much. Yeah, because I know how hard it can be when you're struggling with the the game of sexuality. So, yeah, just call me anytime, day or night. Honestly, especially night if you want to call me. My gosh, you're such a special friend. Mm, yes, I am. So, like, my wife, just to be clear, she goes to bed at around 12, so pretty much wide open after that for any help you need. Any help at all. Just... Well, I'll tell you what. What if tonight, after my wife goes to sleep and your wife goes to sleep, mm-hmm. we pray together? That That sounds great. I am not gay anymore. Yeah, apparently not. What? Nothing. Is it good for you? <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for more of this shit. And we're going to rejoin the action midway through his gig at the fucking Ramada. And, and this time he's telling us about the time that his Christianity kicked in. I never get this fucking story, right? This is the story that Christians always tell about the time they turned Christian, but they were already Christian then. Right, because it always happens when they were at church or at some Christian concert. But this is the moment that Jesus like made it official. Like, he consummated his relationship with Christ, especially in this movie where he is just constantly seeking Jesus and talking about. Oh, and then I really doubled down on Jesus, and then I tripled down on Jesus. Yeah, and then he's just like, yeah, some lady said. The Holy Spirit just told me that someone in this room of forty five hundred people has a secret. 
It's you. <laughs> Just doing a little light cold reading. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> So he was bootlegging an album at a Christian concert, which, by the way, is the weirdest circle of hell. If you ever find yourself there, <laughs> and like that's not a joke. He, when he's telling the story, he's like, "I bootlegged, and bootlegging is a sin, and it is wrong." But I yes, do it. he does. <laughs> it's like right up there. It's like my sins. I bootlegged, and I fucked every guy in Western Oklahoma. <laughs> Those are m- my two sins. <laughs> so. Also, there's a high school prom in here later, so please don't leave your trash on the floor. They got to do a quick turnover. <laughs> it's 4.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> we only have the room till five. Yeah, okay. And so, like, yeah, he's watching this concert. In the middle of the concert, the singer stops, and she's like, hey, one of you is gay. Stop it. <laughs> and she, he has this whole big thing where he starts talking about, like, you know, she says, imagine it's like... Christmas Day and the gift that you got, Jesus, is all your sin in a box and you give it away and you don't have it anymore. And Jesus gives you a gift too, salvation, right? That was the big moment for him. That did it for him. Yeah. Like Dennis was like, I needed to learn that I had to give and receive. And I'm like, buddy, that's what Chuck's been trying to tell you. (laughs) (laughs) You've got to give and receive. It's a two way street. Yeah. And he's, 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 Hearing this is like, give Jesus your gayness as a Christmas gift. And I really wanted to see that happen. Happy birthday, Jesus. You guys, you shouldn't have. Really. Oh, go on, go on, open it. It's. It's. It's my gayness. Ah. Oh. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I gave it to you like the lady at the concert said. Oh, yeah, yeah, cool. That's um That's great. You you don't like it, do no, you? No, 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 it, it's great. I love it. Uh, where'd you get it? Um from you, I think. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's it's kind of like a regift if you think about it. Yeah, I guess so. You you can return it if you want to you. Please don't. Not to me, though. Open mine next. Can I ask, is it your sexuality? No. It's your sexuality. It is. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) And then he was Christian. Or where he was already Christian. But now, now his Christianity counted. I who the fuck knows? Yeah. Is this where he says, like, I don't want the gay community to define me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which, like, for the record, I don't let the gay community define me either. They're like weirdos. Like, don't. <laughs> yeah, me neither. They don't, I don't let them. Def- I don't let them define me like this. <laughs> but so what he's talking about here, though, is that he say he's like, you know, the gay community tried to define me because my boyfriend asked me to say the words. You're I'm gay at one point after we just did a bunch of gay stuff. Right. So that, and, and now he has recast that as the gay community trying to define him. And I'm like, no, the gay community trying to define you is when they're like bear, otter, <laughs> <laughs> other animal. <laughs> like every day they're like, are you a giraffe? Like, what's your deal? I, uh, and I'm like, I, I don't even, that's the, <laughs> like, I can't do that either. Like, I'm with him on that point. Yeah. The hanky coat is confusing. I get it. Yeah. It's so <laughs> many colors and folds. I guarantee you, though, that what the gay community told him was be yourself. And he's like, no. Right. Yeah. Again, just to be clear, it's like that fucking opening pilot of the adventure zone where it's like, believe in yourself, Dennis. Never. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> also, I just want to point out that at the height of this moment in the movie, he's like singing a very emotional song. And apparently he was doing it very flatly because Anna walked in the room and began to yell the correct notes at the television. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to hear that because like what I wrote in my notes right there was the worst part is this song is probably supposed to sound like that. <laughs> but it wasn't. Uh, okay. She's just like like that whole speech was weird because it was like I'm gay because I'm was tempted like Jesus. You know, Jesus tempted I was tempted like Jesus. Like was Jesus tempted with fucking dudes? Yeah, I, I missed that part in the desert. Well, yeah, no, no, Jesus was he went through all the temptations, apparently. Yeah, I really want to watch them making it through that list. 
Yeah, every temptation. Really? Everyone. Okay, Jesus, what about finishing the juice? I'm sorry, finishing the juice, Satan? Yeah, you know, when there's like half a glass of juice left. So you want to just like, ah, I should just finish this. Uh, no. Okay, good. Resist it. Uh, next up, signing up for a free trial and then canceling. Really? Is that, I mean, it's, it's a free trial. Is that bad? I mean, it's a temptation. It's not necessarily bad. We just got to get through literally all of them. So, free, free trial. Yeah, sure, fine. No. All right, resisted. Great, no on the free trials and canceling. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, the exhaustive list on that. It must, must, must have taken a minute. And then God made him straight. Oh, did God give me a boner? Hell yeah, God gave me a boner. <laughs> He's like, when the Lord began to change me, I began to wonder, are you changing me in every area of my life, Father? Like, can I teleport? Am I Hispanic now? I don't. How does this all work? <laughs> He's like, he has a little conversation where he's like, so I said to God, like, wait, I'm changed now, like all the way. And God's like, yeah, man, what do you think we're doing here? I'm doing it all. And I'm like, man, God sounds rad as hell. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 like God sounds pretty chill. Yeah. He's like, so, hey, Jesus, are, are you taking away the parts where I get turned on by my naked dudes? And he's like, yeah, hell man, yeah, who, man. Who thought made you think that uh, who made you uh, love the naked dudes to begin with me? Right. It's all me. <laughs> I built you up, I tear you down, I built you back up, man. Yeah, cool. exactly. <laughs> We're going to go smoke Jesus a drink. do some keg stands at the end of this conversation or something. <laughs> um, and then and then he's like, and then I got to marry a woman. Something I thought I'd never do because you know how you can drink Alka-Seltzer if you do it real quick? It, it tastes <laughs> real bad if you do it slow. That's how I met. And also, this is where she it, she does her struggles, which were really, really exciting until she reveals them to us, which is a big bummer. So but, first of all, wait, we have to tell who the wife is. We haven't said who the wife is. Oh, yes, oh, we okay. have. Yeah, obviously. It's a surprise. It's Melinda, the girl that he wished that he could be aroused by back in college. <laughs> the only oh. woman we've been introduced to so far. Yes, exactly. Movie. The only female in the movie, except for fucking Mauricio's <laughs> wife. Yeah. Oh, and the mom. And the mom. Oh, yep, yep. And his mom. Yep. Where's that Disney cartoon? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she she's like, you know, we each had a past. I had my darkness and he had his. And I was like, okay, his is fucking dudes. I want to know what Marines were because she was talking about it real, real sketchily. And it was funny too because she's like, we were about to get married and we did not tell each other our past because he had struggles and I've had struggles. And I'm like, whoa, Melissa, you okay? All right. Yeah. What did she do? I don't know why I'm asking. Well, no, you have to read between the lines because what she said was on our wedding day, he made me feel like a spotless bride. And I'm like, oh, so your your struggle was you fucked a guy? Like, Dennis fucked 40 guys. Yeah. Like, it's not quite... <laughs> a not day quite, in his <laughs> weird oh, okay, Christian I college. was about to ask, what the hell was the spotless bride thing? Yeah, that's that's her... Like, she wasn't spotless. And but I, he I, made that her That was feel her spotless. dark secret? Like, her dark that secret was, was dark the, secret. the same as his? Yeah, yep. they both fucked 40 guys, apparently. Yeah, right? <laughs> what? She oh, blew a minor no. league baseball team. Yeah. Also, Patrick, I'm just saying, yeah. if you did not tell your husband I see you as a spotless bride at your wedding, you wasted a wedding. <laughs> I know. <laughs> to be fair, he was spotless. We had <laughs> both of the suits dry cleaned. Now, <laughs> after the wedding, <laughs> there were some spots. So, okay, so now we watch him and his wife eat. Then they argue about where and when they first kissed. So, you know, it was crazy memorable. Okay, wait. They are in the middle of an argument about their first kiss when someone, the only word for this is slaps down their KFC famous bowls in front of them. Just, I remember him telling me, blam, here's your fucking food. <laughs> so, you know, at least he still tips like a Christian. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, this is it's such a weird conversation because like they talk about their first kiss and then they kind of cut to like just Melissa or Melinda or whatever we said her name was. <laughs> and she's like, 
Oh, does he get aroused? He gets aroused. And on his end, he's got no complaints. And I'm like, mm, he's got complaints. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> like, compl- the chief among them is that you don't have a penis. Well, exactly. <laughs> Well, it is so, again, it's so euphemistic, right? Because we have to sit there and, like, listen to them say, oh, yeah, no, we fuck, we fuck. Uh, but but they can't say that, right? So he's like, yeah, no, on our wedding night, I sure was terrified of her vagina. But turns out I love the pussy. I've loved it the whole time. Just didn't realize it until just then. <laughs> um, and she's like, yeah, no, his penis is entirely adequate. Um, Someone comes in and whispers in his ear, and he's like, I have just been informed that bisexuality exists. Uh, Fuck. Fuck everybody! I, I thought if you could I, I don't do even, the one, you eliminated the other. I don't even know if that's what's going on here. Like, uh, uh-uh. uh, he's just gay. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, he he admitted he wasn't aroused by women. Like, you can make yourself get an erection. I've done it. <laughs> yeah, that's no, pretty can... much her testimonial. You can make yourself get an erection. <laughs> also, with them like swing. Sing- that's the subtitle to the movie. Sing over me. <laughs> you can make yourself get an erection. <laughs> Oh, yes. There, where's our gay conversion uh. program? We could make millions. And again, them talking about the goodness of their sex. I, again, there's no amount of money I wouldn't give to charity to just be like, yeah, describe the great sex. Go on, Melinda. Just give me a, give me those sweet, sweet deets. Cause she'd be like, oh man, it's like a, whoo boy. You ever, <laughs> you ever quit mini golf in a rage? It's just like that. Boy, do I. <laughs> <laughs> Numbers. That's a spicy meatball. <laughs> Guys, they have nine kids. Uh, yes, yes. They, okay, they have so nine they, children. Now, and he even says now to those people who say I only have nine kids to prove that I've had sex with my wife almost double digit number of times. That's why would anyone even say that? It's, <laughs> it's weird that I would bring that up in my movie. Yes. Crazy. Right? And well, the, he also has this moment where he has to like. He has to tell his wife about his sordid past, right? And he's like, you know, and I took her to the side and I said, honey, I don't know how to tell you this, but I used to be gay. And you know what? She knew. She had guessed it. She's like, yeah, you're very obviously gay even now when we're having, you know, the mechanical hate sex nine times. Or whatever. Yeah, your, your cell phone number's written on a lot of bathroom stalls, huh? I got it. <laughs> Figured it out. The way she brings it up is like he's talking about how like, how this is weighing on him because like she knows he has a secret, but he's never told her. And, and it's just, he's in bondage. And I'm like, you wish you were in bondage. Yeah. And <laughs> she's like, he's like, I've got to tell my wife. I've got to tell my wife. And she says, I was so nervous because I was like, what could he possibly tell me? And then she's like, you fucked half of Oklahoma. That's it. Wait, That's which all. Half? <laughs> the men, the men have. Oh, the guys. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, me too. But like, she's literally like, she's like, what? Oh, that's it. You just gay and you fucked a bunch of dudes. Well, who cares? I'm like, you took it remarkably well. She's like, look, we should compare lists. Yeah, they have the same guys. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Steve from South Bend. Yeah, that guy just fucks. Yeah, that guy just so- fucks. Good for him. Good for Steve. <laughs> I just like those nine kids are gonna watch this documentary and know that their dad fucked his way through Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah. Like all the first half of the documentary is like, he's not just being like, I'm gay. He's like, I was sleeping with a lot of dudes, like a lot of dudes. I'm like, your kids are going to watch this. <laughs> well, and he, he touches on it too. Cause he's like, Oh, now it was time to tell my son. I used to be gay. And I remember my son said to me, that's, that's great, dad. That's, that's cool. Good. No, <laughs> no but you have to understand that. <laughs> Son, I don't think you're getting the picture. I was very gay. No, no, I get it, Dad. I, that's fine. No, but like really gay. <laughs> Look at how many notches there are on this headboard. I'm going to lower myself <laughs> down on this pineapple, son, and I want you to imagine that this is the state of Oklahoma. Please, so, no. Please let me leave now. <laughs> Well, and then we, we see all these like home movies as if to say, like, look at all these family memories that gayness tried to rob him of. And we're hearing this Christian song in the background. This is the one that I wrote let down the lyrics for. This is this guy's fucking job. All right. To write shit like, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for loving and setting me free. Thank you for giving your life just for me. How I thank you, Jesus, Jesus, I thank you. His job is to write that. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> which which it seems like he has like a a hot key for Jesus and thank you and Lord, and he just lets the cat walk and forth across it, and he's the famous singer. Yes. Oh, it's so fucking bad. Again, free and me. It's all like that. Also, just want to throw out there, Patrick, just to confirm, when you got gay married, your family did disappear like back to the future, right? That is what happened. You can't be gay and have a family, right? Everyone vanished from the photos. Yes. Yeah, okay, was, good. I was just we, checking because otherwise know, we, we call it a post birth abortion. Oh, okay, good, good to know. Good to know, because otherwise that weird montage of his family videos is weirdly manipulative and insane. But yeah, since it's real, since you post-birth abortion your whole family when you're gay, then yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Well, um, and this, and he has this whole conversation where he talks about, like, it was very important to me that I instill all of this hatred and bigotry that's crippled my happiness early and often in my children. Right? He's like, it was most important to tell my oldest son because he was the gayest of my kids, I guess. I don't know why that was the most important. <laughs> that is what is truly astonishing to me about this movie. This guy spends the first, you know, three hours of this hour and 18 minute movie. Yeah. Talking about how as a child, hearing these things was so incredibly hurtful to him. It made him feel scared and alone. It made him feel like... Like everyone hated him, that God hated him, that he was this aberration upon the face of the earth. And it just tore him up inside. He'd hide underneath the blankets on his bed. Yeah. And he grows up and decides, I got to do that to my kids. Like, that's insane to me. Like, that's like, like, that's cruel. Oh, absolutely. Look, right. Like, I know how damaging this is, and I'm doing it anyway. I'm excited to do it. Yeah, yep. and I make my list. This has been like if I was abused as a child by a podcast, and I was like, "All right, let's get this fucker started." Yeah, fire her up. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Not only am I reinforcing this with my children, but I'm reinforcing it with my music. I'm making a movie about it. I go off and I do concerts where I sell this fucking idea. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, victim and victimizer throughout this movie. It's real hard to know where to put your sympathy. Ugh. Jesus. And then we have again this like. Bane bullshit minor ass effort at a miracle. Remember, this is the part where he's talking about like a and then there was this old lady that told me my grandma always used to stand behind me when I played piano and she would pray that I'd become moderately famous and not gay anymore or whatever. What's funny to me is that the woman, the woman who says this to him, just he describes as his grandmother's prayer partner, which if I know anything about Oklahoma at this point in the movie. It's that prayer partner was probably like a lover. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of many that grandma had. Yeah, also, exactly. The the image of this lie is ridiculous, right? He, he didn't notice an old lady standing behind him muttering to herself for three hours a day for years. <laughs> <laughs> How much room was in the shed? Not any. We saw the shed. <laughs> That's why we had to put the piano out in the field, goddammit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, this is ridiculous. Oh, he, when he tells his parents, like, this is ridiculous, too, because he, like, sits his parents down, and he's like, I had to tell them that I'm gay. And it's like, I, I just imagine, like, Mary Pat and Frank, or whatever their names are, mm -hmm. sitting there on the couch, and he's like, Mom, Dad, I'm gay, but really gay. Like, I fucked a lot of guys, but but not anymore. I'm done. And them just being like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Something tells me I'm just, you know, I, I, I hate to like uh, let his look define him, but something tells me that is not what dad's reaction was. <laughs> I, I'm just like, I don't want my mom and dad to listen to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine sitting them down to be like, this is what I do in bed. <laughs> Yeah, because no one should do that. Only Christianity could create a moment where you think it's a worth talking about in your documentary where you sat down and talked about your sex life to your parents. <laughs> do you think his wife was there for this? Yeah, oh, right. I bet you. Absolutely. I bet all nine of his kids were. <laughs> so, all right. So just when you thought maybe this was all fucking over and we could just go home. No, we go back to the goddamn field piano. Right. Yep. Where he starts talking about like 
how Jesus is so great that even in the, quote, depravity of his homosexuality, Jesus never gave up on him. Mm -hmm. He's also going to hedge his bets here and be like, hey, you know, people tell me all the time here when you've probably stopped watching the documentary how damaging and dangerous my message is and how easily Googleable the statistics about suicide among people who attend conversion therapy are. But um, no. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. He's like, you know, some people tell me my message is terribly damaging, but then I pretend I didn't say the things I said earlier in this movie and I sleep at night just fine. Yeah. Right. Because the defense that he tries to construct for himself is I'm not trying to tell anyone what they need to do. I'm telling them what I felt like I needed to do. And in so doing, I'm defining their love as depravity and telling them that God thinks that they're worse than murderer rapists. But I'm not telling them what to do. I'm not telling anyone that they don't have to be anything. I'm just saying they don't have to be gay. Yeah, right. Right. He also compares being gay to being hit by a car. Yep. Yeah, right. No, if my kid, yeah, he gives the whole, like, if, if, if I saw somebody about to step out in the street and get hit by a car, I, I would be negligent not to stop them, right? Just like fucking Ray Comfort's lesbian elevator analogy or whatever. Yeah. No, he, he's, he's not trying to tell you that what to do with your life. He's just trying to tell you that it's dumb and dangerous and stupid and evil is all. I was hit by a gay car. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, what do you think? What do you think is the gayest car? Oh, it's obviously the Prius. No, there's a correct answer. No, it's okay. not the Prius. Right. It's not a Prius. Uh, the VW Bug. See, that is the correct answer. A lot of people get <laughs> a lot of people get tri tripped up and say the Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile, but that's oh, wrong. Right, right, it's yeah. wrong. That's homophobic. The correct answer yeah. is the VW Bug. Okay. There we go. See, I knew we'd find it eventually. <laughs> All right. So and, and yeah, and so he has this long moment where he's like, you know, look, I. I, I know that this story is basically hate speech, but I'm going to tell it anyway. He even uses the word, right? He says, you know, there's some people who would probably accuse my, say my story was hate speech. Can you imagine that? And I'm like, yeah, yep, sure can. Yeah. You, you brought it up, actually, because you've admitted that hearing it leads people to the brink of suicide. Yep. This is also where we get Eli presenting his picture. Oh, God. <laughs> Poor little Eli. That's just going up on the fridge, isn't it? <laughs> Eli, Eli painted a picture. And this is, again, why I am 100% convinced that Eli is just pranking him. He painted a picture of a man exploding onto another man. Yes. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's a prank. Like, he's tricking this man. Oh, yes. God, I hope so. Eli, That's if amazing. you're out there and you achieved this fantastic prank, please reach out to us. <laughs> this is like this is like those kids that the amazing Randy set up with that or whatever. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The yeah, Project yeah. Alpha. Yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah, yeah. He sent all those kids to fuck with those people. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I, I just want to point this out. I, I want to underscore this because this is deeply meaningful to me and important that everyone understand that at the end of this movie. When he's talking about how, like, you know, there are those who would tell me that I shouldn't be giving this message and I shouldn't be sharing this message because it very obviously contributes to suicide. He he defends himself by condemning the people who oppose this movie for being judgmental. Yep. Talk about the fucking pot calling the kettle a pot. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Jesus, he's like, people point out how wrong the church has been about so much stuff in the past, but then I put my fingers in my ear and I yell, la, 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 real loud, and eventually they shut up. Yeah, his literal answer, to, he says, you know, the ch people say the church has gotten so many things wrong over so many years. How do you know you're not wrong about homosexuality? My answer? N no, cut the camera. Cut it. <laughs> Why would we put this in our movie? Why is this in our movie? <laughs> ah, I set up a rhetorical trap that I walked right into myself. Yes, right. <laughs> I myself just set the rake there and then stepped on it. <laughs> and then, okay, all right. And then, as if this movie wasn't already bad enough, as though we didn't have enough ammunition, he's going to show us the goddamn tombstone that a friend bought him for gay him. <laughs> Which, to be fair, is metal as hell. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that's that's pretty metal. 
He has this moment where he's like, you know, I just knew that people would slow down as they drove by and go, did, did someone bury their gayness? That's fucking weird. <laughs> he's like, I love to look out the window. I love looking out the window and seeing cars slow down. I'm like, you're causing traffic accidents to own the gays? <laughs> like, Right. So he's literally got this goddamn tombstone where the old him, the gay him has been buried and he puts it out in his front yard. And he starts talking about how, like, I love the idea that people will stop and I'll, like, trick them into reading it because they'll think it's a dead person. And then it's basically like a chick track only made of stone, you know, and confusing because it doesn't mention that I'm. Gay. Oh, man, people are just going to think I'm dead. Oh. <laughs> and then when I die, if I get buried here, they're going to think I was twins with the same. No, oh, I've really done d- bamboozled <laughs> myself this time, guys. I really got me this time. <laughs> Again. Yeah. And then, okay. And remember, he, he was talking about bootlegging that uh, concert when they were telling him about the present that you could give to Jesus with your gayness in it or whatever. We hear that audio. He plays that audio. And while we're listening to that audio, we're watching him back at the at the field piano, holding his arms out and surrender to the Lord. <laughs> but his arms get tired. Yes. So we watch him be like, uh, eh, a little bit. Do lower. you have enough video yet? <laughs> <laughs> well, so so that right there, that right there, because so this is like the third or fourth time we've seen the field piano, and when we start, it's like it's it's we see the storm coming. In the middle of the movie, it's just raining on him, ruining the piano as he yeah. plays it, just absolutely destroying it. And then at the end, the storm has passed. And I'm like, how long do you think they like set up that <laughs> piano and waited for that storm to start and stop? Um, it's <laughs> Oklahoma, so eight minutes. Oh, is that? Is that <laughs> yeah. All right, well, they cut that joke. I thought it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now, and, and then finally, we... We cut to a black screen. We still hear him crying for like 30 fucking seconds at the end of it, which is a perfect summary of the movie, right? The movie's over and he's still crying. And normally I try to ask a question that sort of wraps up my feelings on the movie. I've got a good one here, and I mean this seriously. Should we report this one to Amazon? (laughs) <laughs> like seriously like like I, we've watched movies before where like had they been on amazon prime i would have been like i should probably tell them that this is on here you know like the unexpected bar misfit type shit but like in, in terms of like stuff that we found on mainstream services this is the worst thing ever right uh yeah i mean right to believe is also on amazon i oh, think oh is it really so oh okay all right we'd well, have then, to tell them about no. a lot of stuff going on yeah i guess I so mean, okay and like here's the thing the, the movie is is very insidious in this, that they don't really, like, this guy's doing a lot of terrible shit, but they don't really go into that. Like, they don't talk about the electroshock therapy stuff. They don't talk about the camps. They don't talk about, like, kidnapping kids and sending them to this, like, gay conversion camp. They don't talk about any of that. It's the story of this guy and just his life and the choices he has made. And so, like, what do you report it for? Like, what do you, you know, and it's like, like, cause we know like what he's getting at here. We know what he's doing, but like, like it's super like, again, just insidious that, he, that like they're hiding it cause they know what they're really doing would be a turnoff. Well, so, okay. So, but here's the thing. My, my shorthand, my, my, uh, my rule of thumb is you make it black. Right. So imagine that there's a documentary on there all about how evil and terrible it is and how much God hates black people. And it's all these people trying not to be black. I feel like that one would get reported, wouldn't it? Should yeah. or picked up by HBO and a bunch of people would see it. <laughs> it could be that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Well, that's my fucking dilemma. One way or the other, we got to try to get that rating down from four and a half stars. People help us out there. That is going to do it, however, for our review of Sing Over Us. It's not going to do it for the episode just yet, though, because we still need to trick ourselves into coming back. So, Eli, tell us, what's on deck? Well, it's Valentine's Day next week, which means we tricked my wife back on the show for Beauty and the Beast, a Latter-day Tale. Spoiler alert, that will not be that movie's only title. Nope. No, it will not. And yes, and and when Eli says tricked, that's because we already recorded that episode because that weekend we actually will be in L.A. at our live show, which you'll hear two weeks from now. And uh, hey, you know, if you didn't already get tickets, tough shit. It's too fucking late. I told you it was going to sell out. I told you it was going to fucking sell out. 
Wait, so Eli, is that a Mormon movie with multiple titles? Yes, it is. It believes it believes that a movie shouldn't just have one title, but can have as many titles <laughs> as it Can't wants. Can't believe we missed that. Can't believe that we is, missed that. That is correct. All right. Well, with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 234 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to help yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation to patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help us done by leaving a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist Citation, Dated and The Skeptocrat, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of PA Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slot of evil drafts on Mars. All other music was written and performed by our audio engineer Morgan Clark and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm No Illusions, promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. Dennis would eventually be caught having a gay affair because literally everyone who does this is eventually caught having a gay affair. Yep. Chuck has since opened a series of gay-themed restaurants called Guy Fieri's American Kitchen, where he specializes in donkey sauce. He was recently re-elected as mayor of Flavortown. <laughs> Eventually, the one child that survived that Patagonian massacre found Melinda and had her revenge. <laughs> I had so much more fun with Melinda's past than you guys did. Yeah, you did. <laughs> That's because you, you didn't did. pick up on Spotless Bride. Yeah, no, you're right, I did This is going to kick ass. Oh, this was so hard to watch. Like, okay, so <laughs> just, I, 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 this took me all goddamn day yesterday. I started this <laughs> at like 10 in the morning. I finished this at like, I don't know, like midnight. It was <laughs> I, so hard to watch. I was shocked, genuinely shocked that the movie was like an hour and 12 minutes because it took me three hours to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so normally for me, it's it's two minutes per minute, right? Like, so if, if the movie we're reviewing takes 90 minutes, it usually takes me about three hours to get through because I pause, I write notes, I have to go back, it, like, listen to things over again, et cetera, et cetera. But this one, I just had to get up and walk away, you know? <laughs> I just had to I, I, do other work or something. It was insanity. I'm kind of very upset with you all for making me watch this movie. <laughs> all right, well, keep in mind that it's Eli that you should be upset with. I, I had nothing to do with I mean, I was going to watch it. I didn't have anything to do with making you watch it. So. The no that, wanted to do Velocipaster, and I yeah, said, I no, that, Patrick. <laughs> that, that made me really upset because I logged on to Amazon Prime and to look up this godforsaken movie, and Velocipaster, one of the claw or man of the claw was listed on there. And I was like, how are we not watching this instead? Yeah, <laughs> no, that's not our speed. It's more fun for us when they take it seriously. Usually when they mean it, when they mean it from the heart, it, when we like it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe not anymore. Like before going into this one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I feel dirty. All right. So we're going to get going here. <clears throat> The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.